Nintendo's 800-pound gorilla comes home to roost at last on Good Intentions, episode 19. Wait, do gorillas roost? So here's a striking moment for this whole chronological NES endeavor. Donkey Kong, the single most important title of the Japanese family computer launch, literally the game that Masayuki Uemura and his team designed the hardware around, appears on the US system as the console's 19th release. Where Donkey Kong marked the beginning of the Famicom story, here it serves as more of a segue. In Japan, Nintendo launched its console ambitions with Donkey Kong. In America, however, the game instead marks the point at which the NES upshifted from first to second gear. So Kong remains a landmark for American audiences in a sense, but one that in many ways feels overshadowed by its own legacy. After all, once you've played Super Mario Bros., which debuted alongside the NES and was already shipping by the time the American edition of Donkey Kong arrived, it can be tough to go back to the game that kicked off Mario's legacy and 2D platformers in general. There are obviously some mitigating factors here, the biggest of them being that Super Mario Bros. may have technically shipped first in America, but it did so in a handful of markets and in modest numbers. Most American consumers wouldn't have a chance to experience the NES until after Donkey Kong's arrival. Thanks to the console's limited initial release, it arrived in the wider US retail market with a massive onslaught of Mario and Donkey Kong games in tow, an embarrassment to franchise riches. Super Mario Bros. acted as the eye-catching, cutting-edge work, whereas Donkey Kong had the nostalgic edge. Sure, the game was only five years old by the time the NES reached the general US market, but video games were much younger back then. Those five years, spanning the first half of the 80s, were, in console game terms, nothing less than an epical consideration. In the half-decade between Donkey Kong's arcade premiere and arrival on NES, the US console business saw the debut of several competitors to the Atari 2600, the collapse of every TV gaming system at retail, the general abandonment of consoles in favor of PCs, and the arrival of new competitors from Japan. It was a tumultuous time, and in many ways the NES worked because it felt like a fresh start from the troubled business that had come before. The idea of retro gaming didn't exist in 1986, but if it did, Donkey Kong is what it would have looked like. And by 1986, Donkey Kong had seen an impressive number of sequels. Donkey Kong Jr. and Donkey Kong 3, both of which showed up here on NES alongside the original, plus all the Mario spin-offs, Mario Brothers Wrecking Crew, and of course, Super Mario Brothers. All of which, again, were available on NES alongside Donkey Kong itself in the summer of 1986. Counting all the other Donkey Kong related titles we'd seen on other platforms, like the Donkey Kong Hockey and Donkey Kong 2 Game & Watch units, or the mysterious Return of Donkey Kong for NES, teased for years as an upcoming title by Nintendo of America more or less from the moment the console arrived in America, before quietly vanishing from release lists several years later. So while it's a little strange to think that a game this significant to Nintendo's history would arrive so unceremoniously as a US release, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Ultimately, Donkey Kong's place at the NES launch speaks to how much the company had matured as a game maker over those five eventful years. It's no exaggeration to say Donkey Kong represented the cornerstone of Nintendo's video game business. The company had seen its share of hits prior to Kong's debut, but none of those had the same profound impact as the 1981 arcade cabinet would. Unlike Nintendo's earlier game successes, Donkey Kong also was a wholly original creation. While thematically similar in spirit and name to the movie King Kong, its mechanics, structure, and visuals had no real precedent in video gaming. The closest thing Donkey Kong might have had to direct inspiration within the medium would likely be Universal's Space Panic, a proto-platform game that involved evading monsters on platforms connected by ladders. The similarities between the two works ended there with the platforms and ladders, as Space Panic lacked the jump mechanic so central to Kong's design. If you boil it down, Space Panic amounted to a sideways Heiyankyo alien clone, with the action revolving around the player's ability to use a shovel for digging pits in which to trap dangerous aliens. In that sense, Space Panic had as much to do with Pac-Man, the maze chase concept and all that, as it did Donkey Kong. So when Donkey Kong burst onto the arcade scene in 1981, it created an instant sensation, in large part because audiences had been primed for a game like this. After Space Invaders and Pac-Man, arcade goers were eager for the next big video game intrusion into mainstream pop culture, and Donkey Kong had all the ingredients to be a hit. 
For starters, it featured memorable characters, an even more charismatic cast than that of Pac-Man. Kong himself seemed enormous on screen at the time, a huge animated gorilla stomping about at the top of the screen. But protagonist Mario and his distressed damsel Pauline had their own appeal, and the storyline, tried and overplayed as a kidnapping was, presented a simple goal and lent the whole thing a semblance of narrative that certainly had never been seen before in a coin-op game. The game looked great too, with vivid colors against a stark black background, and simple but charming animation. Most of all though, it played beautifully. Donkey Kong certainly confronted players with greater complexity than any arcade hit game to date, but it was the right degree of complexity at the right time. Arcade games had steadily grown more complex over the decades since Pong's debut, with Space Invaders as the first big hit to offer players a firing option in addition to linear left-right movement. 1980's Pac-Man broke from linear movement by offering players a sinuous maze to navigate at high speeds, but it balanced out this leap in player freedom by taking away the action button and giving players a single input again, a four-way directional stick. Probably isn't a coincidence that Pac-Man had become a bigger hit than Namco's own remarkably similar Rally X, which arrived in arcades at the same time as Pac-Man to give players a more involved take on the maze chase. Rally X had similar goals to those of Pac-Man, collect all the items in a maze while avoiding enemies, but it included an action button which allowed players to turn the tides and unleash a smokescreen that would block enemy cars. Pac-Man also included the ability to get a jump on bad guys, as in Rally X, but it didn't involve the use of a button. Instead, you could simply grab one of four Energizer pellets within the maze and gain the ability to remove a maze monster, or four, from the action momentarily. No extra inputs required, the power-ups existed in the maze as part of the environment, and players could empower themselves by simply passing over and grabbing one. Donkey Kong increased the complexity of play a step above that of Pac-Man, adding a jump button back to the mix on top of the four directional controls. But this was also a measured form of complexity. For one, the jump mechanic wherein players tapped a button to cause Mario to spring into the air felt intuitive and logical thanks to the creative decision to go with a side-on view similar to Space Panics. Mario could run freely left and right, like the missile base in Space Invaders, and, as in Space Invaders, verticality existed largely as a secondary consideration. Instead of firing projectiles along the vertical axis as in Space Invaders though, players either caused Mario to climb ladders, vertically, or else could use the jump button to propel himself, vertically, into the air. Since you viewed the action in an ant farm cutaway-like view, running and jumping or climbing represented the only two axes of motion. And Donkey Kong designer Shigeru Miyamoto took another cue from Pac-Man. The normally defenseless Mario could briefly gain offensive capabilities, but this ability lacked its own input. Instead, you had to use the jump button to leap into the air to snag hammers that would temporarily allow Mario to lay about himself in a flurry of automated barrel smashing. Again, using a tool within the environment to render the hero nearly indestructible, but only for a few seconds. This talk of complexity and interfaces may seem a bit in the weeds, but it really was a crucial consideration in the early days of the arcade. Remember that Atari had bombed a decade earlier with the first ever commercial video game, Space War. Many historians blame Space War's detailed physics and multiple buttons for its demise. It all proved far too much to deal with for the average person who had never seen a video game before. It was Pong that would become gaming's breakout hit, in large part because it gave players a simulation of a familiar sport and a single interface device. Decades later, that same need to keep things simple caused Nintendo's Wii console and one-touch mobile games to become far greater successes than consoles and high-end PC games, which involved complex controllers and tons of commands to mentally file away. Nintendo took something of a risk with Donkey Kong in 1981 because it felt far more intricate and involved than any successful arcade game before it, and the demands it placed on players could easily have caused the game to flop. Keep in mind that not only did Donkey Kong establish the idea of platform running with two axes of movement, controlled with a four-directional joystick and a jump button, it did so through an ever-changing array of environments. When Mario completed a stage, the action didn't simply start over. Instead, Kong moved along to a new scenario, forcing players to navigate an entirely different set of hazards. To this point, video games typically consisted of a single screen or board that would cycle endlessly with higher speeds or more threats, and perhaps some small layout tweaks. Even Pac-Man spent his entire existence running around the same static maze until it imploded on its 256th iteration. In a way, Donkey Kong felt almost like getting four games in one. The game certainly did repeat infinitely as you played, but it did so through a loop of four levels, each distinct. The first stage saw Mario climbing a series of uneven girders while dodging barrels that rolled downward. 
Kong perched atop the stage, tossing barrels as his kidnap victim called for help, creating a simple and intuitive goal. Dodge the hazards, climb the scaffolding, reach Pauline. Once you did make your way to Pauline, however, Kong grabbed her and scampered up to the next phase of the construction site. The exact nature of that challenge varies from version to version. Even the arcade game had its level order switched up during localization into the US market, but ultimately it's one of three challenges. A cement factory, a series of elevators, or the unfinished structure at the top of the building. The cement factory, sometimes referred to as a pie factory by people who somehow fail to notice the construction site theme of the game, looks like something out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. On three of the stage's five tiers, the simple girders of the first level have been replaced by conveyor belts that push bins of wet cement from one side of the screen to the other. These belts will also push Mario along as well, forcing players to work counter to the movement of the floor itself. This proves particularly hazardous on the floor directly below Kong, where a barrel of fire rests in the center of the belts and will happily destroy both Mario and any cement pile that happen to fall into it, all while simultaneously disgorging fireballs that will chase Mario about the screen. To add one final touch of challenge, Kong himself slides back and forth on the upper level along a conveyor belt that constantly changes direction, forcing players to time their approach to Pauline to avoid getting clobbered by the villain. This is by far the most complicated and difficult stage of the game, which probably accounts for its omission in most home ports, including the one on NES. The third stage, generally designated as the 75 meter stage, recasts the automated hazards of the cement factory along the other axis. It replaces the horizontal conveyor belts with a pair of vertical elevators flanking a central platform. Players need to time their jumps across the elevators to avoid being crushed or dropped by the action of the moving platforms, while being mindful of the fact that poor Mario hadn't quite earned his adventuring legs at this point in his career and couldn't survive any jump or fall that amounted to a height greater than his own. And the final stage, wherein Mario finally gets the best of Kong and saves the girl, drops the moving hazards of the previous two stages, and instead turns the entire level design into a dynamic weapon. Mario avoids moving fireballs while passing over eight crucial rivets keeping the entire stage together. And once you've removed all eight of these pegs, the entire assembly of girders collapses and leaves Kong stunned. The end. Well, the end of part one of this retrospective. Next time, how Donkey Kong fared on NES.